This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome back on a given Monday. This is Think Tech Hawaii, and in fact, this is Hawaii's state of clean energy. We got a special show today because uh, Marco Mangelsdorf, who is uh, our contributor every two weeks uh, with uh, Mina Morita, is now here in the studio. This is a real treat. Say hello, Marco. Hello, Marco. Very nicely done. Now, we have a special guest. That's Jay Griffin. He's a PUC commissioner. And Marco, as my co-host in this matter, could you please introduce Jay properly? Well, first, I want to say that uh, I have fantasized about this possibility of being with Jay and Jay and Marco, <laughs> at least since I've come to know Dr. Jay Griffin uh, in his involvement of, uh, of many years in the energy uh, field here in Hawaii. So it truly is a great pleasure for me to be with both of you and uh, from one PhD to another. Great to see you here, and great to have you. Uh, great to have you on the too. show. I'm getting a PhD oh. here on ThinkTech, anyway. Well, uh, I'm happy to award that to you anytime <laughs> you need it. So it's great to be here with you guys. So Jay, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming down. Thanks for having me again. Pleased yeah. to be here, and good to be in both of your companies. Yeah. It's a win-win-win to have the PUC here, to have you here, and congratulations on your confirmation a couple weeks ago. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it, and a relief to get that that part of things over with and focus on our job. Yeah. So we're calling the show uh, uh, Energy Challenges for Hawaii, and, and, and all of that falls in directly or indirectly on the desk of the PUC, so we'd like to, uh, you know, ask you a bunch of questions about it. Um, I suppose, the, well, why don't we start with you, Marco? You have questions. Can you ask a question about challenges? Sure. What do you feel to be the biggest uh, energy challenges facing the state? right now, which is, of course, a very broad question and uh, could go on for days. We could have a little colloquium, I'm sure, on that. But uh, given the time constraints, what would, uh, what would you say to that? Sure. I, well, I think we're moving forward on a number of fronts. Um, I mean, I think since the last time I was here was about three months ago. Uh, we've issued a number of major decisions and orders accepting the Hawaiian Electric Company's power supply improvement plans. Uh, so a major challenge going forward is implementing those plans, and that's going to take, you know, there's a lot of very near-term actions, but the, the near-term scope of that's about five years. So that's, that's going to be a major endeavor for all the stakeholders here in the state. Um, we've accepted a, or approved a number of different power purchase agreements. Uh, so <clears throat> we've, those are a bunch of the near-term actions, but as I look in the very immediate future, there's a number of major issues of great importance to the state, uh, individual customers out there before the commission. Particularly, there's a, a number of pending decisions on new customer programs. Uh, those filings are, have, are coming in or before the commission now, and I know, um, you know we're, we're committed to devoting the attention to that and putting those programs in place in a timely way. We have a, you know, another round of renewable procurement uh, that's anticipated to get underway, so that's another is, uh, you know, the next 18 months or so, there'll be a lot of commission involvement, oversight in that. And, you know, some, again, a lot of, of bigger topics that not necessarily everyone's involved in, but really affect everyone. We have a number of rate cases before the commission, uh, both currently. So these are, you know, we, we review and set acceptable levels of, of costs that ultimately roll up into customer rates. So those are, you know, that's, that's the stuff that's on my desk every day. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it, the complexity and the impact on people is significant, so we, um, we take that very seriously, and, but we've, this is what we signed up to do, and it's exciting business, uh, at times potentially challenging. There are three of you. Um, you, you're, you're good for six years from the time you took office? Right? Actually, five. Five. The term five. starts from, uh, uh, it was July 1st of last year. Okay. So my term's till June 30, 2022. Okay. And Randy Iwasi, the chair, what, what's his uh, what's his uh, scope on this? Uh, till June 30, 2020. Okay. That's just not far away, actually. Yeah. When he when he came down to talk to us, he said he wasn't going to go for another term. So. That's oh I, my Randy's enjoying his time, um, <laughs> but as he always put it, uh, he came out of retirement take on this position, yeah. um, so. And Lorraine, when is her term up? <clears throat> her term is until the middle of next year. Oh, 
June 30, That's really close. 2018. Yeah. So it's it's kind of in process, and, uh, and David Ige will be governor at the time Lorraine's term is up, so he'll be the one to appoint the next the successor to Lorraine on the, on, on the commission. He has a few options available, and to my, I, mean, I have no idea what the, the thinking is there. Okay. Well, he could reappoint her. Somebody else, or, or let it over. hold it over for yeah. a while. Yeah. Exciting! This makes it—it's more moving parts, isn't it? <laughs> well, what I, I guess what it, that said, I would like to think um, with the Senate's decision on my position, it's, it's taken some of the uncertainty off of the commission. Um, the yep. three of us are there for you know yeah. the time there, and we've been working together. We work together well, and so our our focus is on the business before us. Yeah, exciting. So what, you know, you're talking about challenges to Hawaii, what about challenges to the commission uh, in terms of resources, in terms of procedure, in terms of, oh, I don't know, carving new ways to do things, maybe faster ways? What do you see the challenges to the commission? Well, and I was asked this during my confirmation hearing. Um, I don't think anyone, uh, I think everyone would always like to see things happen faster at the commission. We're always balancing, you know, the need to be timely with the due process for the decisions and particularly the more complex or controversial um, that tends to slow things down. But we have been trying to look at ways to help foster more compromise uh, on positions before they get to the commission or at least more dialogue among the parties to, to narrow the scope of the decision making uh, before the commission. So we've been, I think, I mean, I the, again, I go back to um, what I said in the beginning. Probably the biggest challenge is the, the scope, the impact, and the number of major decisions before us. Um, our staff is, I said this in, in my confirmation hearing also, in my time at the commission, uh, which is now, sorry, it's actually almost exactly five years, you know, just about five years uh, from staff and moving on to the commission mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. My view, I mean, we have the, the, the professionalism, the expertise of the staff is as good as it's as good as it's ever been, um, we've you know hired up, so our, our resources are better. But the the breadth of things. I mean, uh, on top of that, we have I think more work than we've ever had. Uh, with just the, the number of things that I talked about, I also don't want to miss. We do have a another merger before us that will be you know occupying occupying time and attention. And a lot of other matters that don't necessarily get the spotlight. We have a lot of water, uh, water and, and private sewer rate cases before us, those types of things. So just trying to stay on top of all that is, is definitely continues to be our biggest challenge. I think it should be skinning down so you deal only with energy, not trucks. Uh, let's see. My, I think I talked about this before. I think um, it's worth a revisit on. Kind of the, the scope of uh, the, the commission's jurisdiction. And there's a management audit underway. Oh, really? Uh, and I know this is one of the topics that they'll be looking at. Uh, as I understand, they're looking at um, both the kind of the management process for how we deal with these dockets, but also considering the, the scope of the, the entities and activities before us. Yeah. So I think, you know, we'll be looking closely at their recommendations. Mm -hmm. And the, the commission actually itself has the ability to look at that, I suppose, and also make recommendations to the legislature. Yes. Uh, ultimately, if I understand, I mean, ultimately, have to be a call to the legislature. Mm -hmm. you know, what what's defined in, in our scope of activities to regulate? Yeah. Marco, your turn. So you you arrived here when, Jay? When did you come from, from, the mainland to move here? Oh, in two summer of two thousand. So you've been in the energy arena in one form or another for a long time, 17 years here. And you've been part and parcel to the, the regulatory process. You've been involved with UH, HNEI, and so forth. So one can only get so much of a sense of what it's really like to be a commissioner from the outside. And then you become a commissioner, as you have been for a number of months now. So my question is, what has surprised you the most compared to your expectations or assumptions prior to sitting in the big chair? Sure. Uh, well, I think on a, the nice part is I, compared to when I was on staff, I actually have more, more time 
freedom to, to read and, and really delve into the details of the filings that are before us. You know, I don't have significant kind of staff management responsibilities like I had before. Uh, so that's definitely the, the upside. And that for me, that's the fun part. These are topics that I'm just intrinsically interested in, um, but also know the importance to people here in Hawaii of our decisions. So I, I get the time to really dig in and understand what we're, we're working on. Um, I mean, the, the weight of the decisions, um, you know, before you, I, as on staff, I would think about it. I would, I would lose sleep at night. I'd say, um, you know, I spend more of those waking and non-waking hours, or uh, supposed to be sleeping hours, thinking about these things. And the weight of it is a little different. When, now, when it's is your it signature. greater? It's greater now yeah, because it is your signature. It's your yeah. signature, yeah. and you need to be be able to stand and be responsible uh, for, you know, at least. Uh, your actions as an individual commissioner. Do you sometimes wake up at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning cogitating well, over a decision? Oh, yeah. I also have a two-year-old daughter, so <laughs> being awake in the middle of the night is... So she, does she cogitate over the decisions? No, 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 no. She's very decisive. <laughs> <laughs> I want this, I don't want that, or I don't like what you did. That's good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so being, I mean, uh, uh, joking aside, Sure, yeah, I mean, the, absolutely. Um, and I honestly, and that happened, and I, until I can feel comfortable, uh, to me that's part of the kind of the gut part of making decisions. If I feel like I can, if I can go back to bed after I think about it, um, that's been part of kind of how I process these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the, um, you know, judiciary, quasi-judicial mantle that you wear. And it's a lonely spot sometimes, yeah. Well, I share it, but it, like I said, it, it is your signature um, when we make these final decisions, so that's critical. You said something before, I just want to follow <clears throat> quickly, and that is um, that you try to limit the scope of what has to be decided by the commission by getting the parties to come together and agree, or at least state what they can agree on. How do you do that? What are the mechanics of doing that? Do you, get in a room and bang their heads together? How do you work that? <laughs> well, it starts, I think it usually, in, in some of the most recent examples, um, I, can, I can think of a couple. So in the way we've set up the schedule of the docket, we've asked for parties to try and file stipulations, which are, you know, it's a word for some. Stipulations of fact, stipulations of? Well, really uh, some sort of global decision. stipulation. Basically, global agreement all the parties have gotten together and said we agree on all these things and here's you know and this is what we think the commission should approve it um a lot of cases we don't so that that um you know if you got to that point that would narrow it down because then we would say well we either agree with that exactly or in parts and but the reality is that there's uh, there's a lot of complexity and compete and in competing positions these things. So what happens is, gen or what has happened is, it's narrowed the scope of difference, and we're left to render decisions on that. In another case, we've actually asked parties to come up with. Um, so this is the case of the community renewables program. Uh, prior to filing at the commission, try and get together and work out the details of the program programs that are acceptable acceptable to the parties. And there we, in that case again, it didn't come together all the way, but I think that, that's that been an approach. We're trying to narrow the scope of things at that point, rather than starting from a total clean slate. Yeah, well, it saves you time. It's well, uh, there's probably gonna be, some people may give, I mean, even in these cases, it's still, these things are still before us. Um, but I, that's that's been the intent, was the, to try and drive to, you know, not only, it, not only just narrow the scope, but have the, have the parties who have the, I mean, that are directly affected, that are implementing these programs on the ground, have them inform the, the details of the, the, the programs from the beginning. Um, so I, that's. But you may or may not accept that. You, you may accept the stipulation, you may modify the stipulation, you may see it as a different way from the parties that stipulated. Yeah. Yeah. Each case is a little bit different, but I think the intent, again, the intent is the same. I think it's, we understand, recognize, that maybe we want to see these things move forward also. The other, the other thing I wanted to ask along the same lines is, is policy. Because uh, like it or not, you guys are a policy-making organization. 
at the end of the day, there's few organizations that are as directly involved in making the short stroke policy that will carry the clean energy initiative forward. Um, where can I find those policies, those statements of policy? Is, is there a book? Up? No, a website, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, it's not always that clean cut. They're, they're usually, um, well, it's either embedded in various decisions. Um, in my time, we've definitely attached, we've, we've um, added exhibits and attached. The inclinations, for Inclinations example. was probably the best example in recent time. Uh, the other one I can think of in the, for the demand response programs, one of those orders in 2014 contained, actually the whole order itself was a policy statement on demand response programs. So it's great to have that because then it becomes a, um, you know, stare decisis, it's kind of a precedent sort of thing. Everybody can see that, read it. <coughs> you, you say, here's our policy. People know that. We're trying to give more guidance and direction to all the parties. Again, this is consistent with what I was talking about before, so that we, I think, hopefully we get programs more in line with those statements. Yeah. Okay. Without asking you to, to divulge or get into private conversations that you have with your other commissioners, I'm just kind of curious in terms of process. Do you guys meet on a regular basis to discuss open dockets uh, in person, uh, you know, once or twice a week, or is it through email or, or, or inter, inter office communication, all of the above? All of the above. And, uh, and uh, I think another thing I'll add, um, maybe not as well known to everyone, actually, in the middle of all this, the commission has moved our offices. We moved from the, uh, the lobby level of our building down into the basement for now, as we're doing. Um, they put you in the basement. Well, we always, our hearing room was in the basement, um, but so they, the, in the past few years, they've knocked all the offices down and rebuilt it. So we have a new office in the basement. The reason I bring this up is one of the, uh, one of the facts out of that is our offices are now all immediately next to each other. Um, so it's a better thing. We're, I mean, we, when we're other. all in the office, I mean, there's just the, the ongoing informal interaction between the commissioners. Um, but to get back to your earlier question, so it's a, I mean, there's no formal set meetings every week, um, but, and it's partly a, the reality of people's different schedules, um, but there's ongoing, uh, well, just that very fact that we're all next to each other, but particularly for all of our biggest decisions, um, recent time, you know, we've, we've had various forms of a one-on-one, -on -one or the, the communication between each other, but also sitting down together generally with drafts of the decisions before us. Where's your hearing room now then? Is it in Blaisdell? We have no, <laughs> no, for, well, fortunately we don't have anything that uh, requires that stature at the moment. Um, it's, so they're, they're renovating the upstairs and ultimately when all the work's done, as I understand, the hearing room will be back, will be upstairs, which is where That's it was a better place historically. Uh, at the moment we don't, have one. We've been using, um, actually we've been using, as I understand it, it's the, the Ninth Circuit, the Court of Appeals has has a uh, chambers over in Hawaii Energy's office. So at times we've used that for a couple of new uh, that's, that's a couple cool. of hearings or wherever we can find available space. Jay, I want to make it clear that you can always meet here. Uh. We can, we, <laughs> we can always have here, uh, have meetings here and you can broadcast them at the same time. There's enough room. We'll see. We'll, <laughs> take, we'll, we'll take that under <laughs> consideration. Let's take a short break to cogitate on that possibility. Um, that's Jay Griffin, a PUC commissioner, and Marco Mangelsdorf, my co-host and informed citizen and president of ProVision Solar. Um, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can. 
can find a way There's got to be solutions How to make a brighter day This is Think Tech. This is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We have uh, Jay Griffin. He's a PUC commissioner, recently confirmed, and Marco Mangelsdorf, a pre president of Provision Solar. So, I want to talk about who hooked up? Sure, and I realize this so much that uh, Jay is likely going to be able to discuss in terms of the details, but let me kind of go after this one on a more broad philosophical level. You know, if you look at what's been going on on the U.S. mainland for the past decades, Utilities have been uh, often getting out of generation, going to more transmission distribution, selling, generating assets, generation assets, and and buying power cheaper from those who would propose long-term power purchase agreements. Right, that's kind of been an overall trend. Do you believe that that's something that should be also kind of the law of the land, or uh, of a high priority here in this state, that in other words, utilities should overall get out of power generation and leave it to the market, the marketplace to be able to put out bids out there, generally speaking, for lower costs of power? Um, so wait, you're just distinguishing Huhunua versus HEP decision, I think was the utilities proposal. Just yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're that's right. Hamakua Energy yeah, Partners. Hamakua Energy yeah. Partners, yeah. yes. Yeah. Excuse me for... Uh, for uh, but you're no, asking a broader question. What, uh, Correct. A couple answers. So and I, I think it, it in, in the inclinations which you uh, brought up earlier, there were statements in there raising the question, posing the question, whether, um, whether the, the policy should basically the direct utilities to, to divest from generation. And the, the concern that's been raised in, in a variety of ways is that there's a potentially hard to distinguish between true reliability concerns, utilities, self-interest, um, both in the dispatch of generation and procurement of new generation. So that, that was a statement put out in 2014. Um, I, think without, I think it was meant to provoked discussion, um, and, it, and it, I think, reflected a lot of concerns at the time. And and, uh, and what we've seen, I mean, the, the decisions of the commission since that time have, have gone in a couple directions. As you know, the commission did, and, and this was one that was prior to my time, the commission denied a proposal from uh, White Electric Light Company to buy out the IPP contract from Hamakua Energy right. Partners. Um, we did deny a proposal from a couple of years ago from Hawaii Electric to build a solar plant at Kahe. We have approved a couple of proposals, one uh, to build solar project here on Oahu and as well as the Schofield Barracks uh, generation plant. So I, my, I guess my answer is that we're still, it's on a case by case basis and you know, Ultimately, we're going to look at what's in the best interest of customers. And the ones that we've approved, there were both um, I mean, the, the West Fox Solar one is generally a, a, the lowest cost solar, so lowest cost solar on this island so far. Schofield Barracks was a little different consideration with the relationship with the military, mm -hmm. the interest in energy security and locating generation uh, outside of you know all these low-lying areas. I know in the, I wasn't on the commission at the time for the Hamakua decision, but I know one of the concerns was, you know, acquiring this long-term asset. Stranded when, asset is a possibility. It, you right. know, when, well, one state policy is saying to move away from fossil fuels and just the, when you looked at the projected use of that plant was going to decline over time. So there is a, there is a, as you point out, um, there's not only a cost difference, but kind of a difference in risk profile for an IPP generator versus utility owned. The, one of the benefits to customers is when that term is up for the contract, um, you can say we're not going to renew it, and the the risk of that stranded asset is on that third party developer, not the utility and its customer base. So if I could kind of put you on the spot a little bit here, Jay, would you have voted with your 
fellow commissioners, if you were on the commission at the time of the HEP, the Humaco Energy Partners decision, would you have voted with them to deny Helco's attempt to purchase from ArcLight that power plant? Yeah, I don't think I can speculate. Uh, I don't think they made a, or, well, I'm going to leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> I can't speculate. What, what well, but, you know, but is it fair to say from all this that price is not the only thing? that there are other factors that may override price in, in the given um, docket. Yes, I mean, uh, that's correct. It's, it's a very, but I, very important, it's, it's, it's a principal consideration. Um, but it's also tied up with other things. In this case, I think part of it was the risk. So it's hard to disentangle price and risk. In this case, one of the, the big ones was risk over time of adding this asset into the into the rate base and who who's going to carry that is it are we going to leave it with a third party or you know because utility makes that acquisition generally they're going to want to hold it for decades yeah. well risk is an economic factor too yeah that's why it's hard to in that case yeah. to disentangle but it is i mean it's they're important can we go to transportation for a minute transportation we had a you know hawaii clean energy day program couple of weeks ago, and uh, we, we wrestled, this is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, we wrestled with that that day as we have wrestled for the last couple of years with this issue. And it's very hard, but it's entangled with energy, it's an also entangled with, with planning, design, uh, zoning, <laughs> any number of, it's, it's like, uh, what was that, that game they used to play, uh, Sim, Sim City? Oh. <laughs> walkable too, <laughs> where, where you, you have to sort of reinvent the whole enchilada when you're dealing with transportation. And yet, this is also on your plate, Jay. Got any thoughts about transportation and where the intersection is? That's not a pun. Where the intersection is about energy and transportation for the commission. Sure. Yeah, I think, um, well, I just step back a little bit. And you're right, the, I mean, it, the going back to the inception of the Clean Energy Agreement, right, transportation was... One of the, I mean, there was a focus on renewable electricity, energy efficiency, but the hope was also I mean, to drive significant change in the transportation sector. And you know, my understanding of the the facts and the data, we are making good progress. I think per capita, we have some of the highest rates of EV adoption and usage. Um, but it's you know we're falling short of what the goals were ten years ago. Um, and I, I think it just, it, it's a more complicated area. It's really driven by, well, a number of different things, but ultimately by individual customer choice on, you know, how we use vehicles, where we choose to live. Um, and so that's a tougher, I mean, I was making, well, prior to our conversation here, that some of the easiest stuff is when you have a regulated utility and, you know, state, the, the legislature and the commission can just, um, direct certain actions to happen. It's far harder um, on this topic. But for the commission, you know, I think there's a number of things right right before us now. Uh, I think it's a, I mean, we understand, I think, the, the cross the, the cross sector effects. But a lot of these topics with, with electric vehicle usage, the pricing programs, um, the opportunities for the utility to invest in some of the infrastructure. Um, I think the, the commission has gen generally been supportive and actually been trying to push further and faster on, particularly on how we can price the use of electric vehicles to support integration of renewables, i.e. basically trying to make uh, cheap daytime rates available for electric vehicles to utilize a lot of the solar that we have. Yeah. So you, your primary focus, as, you know, as the commission, is, is on the utility, what the utility can do or not do in terms of its efforts to push uh, renewable transportation. but. Could the, could the PUC also say, look, we, we think there needs to be a statutory incentive right there, and I can, see it, I can see it in the text in your decision and order. We think there should be an incentive, and we are urging the legislature to in, adopt an incentive or disincentive, as the case may be, in order to advance clean energy and transportation. Is that something you could do or might do, or have you done that? Well, I think I go back to what I, I think we have been trying to, if you look at some of the of the evolution of the electric vehicle rates. We have tried to push that ball a little further, and, and I know some of the earlier proposals didn't think about, or they, they, they were a little limited in 
the lower daytime rates for electricity. So I think our our focus has been for now on the these pragmatic things on exactly the, the types of decisions and incentives available for customers. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean you can't you can't walk the halls of the legislature in January and uh, tell them what to do, but you can write a you can write a decision in an order that makes a recommendation one agency to another, so to speak. They make the final call. Of course. <laughs> Marco? So one of the things I've uh, been teaching my students in my energy politics courses over the years is that my belief that there's really no such thing as a level playing field when it comes to energy, whether local, state, national, or global, because there's just too much at stake. There are too many vested interests, too much money involved. And when you have that much money involved and that much power, you have these players seeking access, right, and influence. Do you believe that, do you, do you believe that as well? That it's difficult, it's not impossible to establish a level playing field when it comes to energy? Well, look, okay, so our, I mean, when I look specifically at our agency, I mean, we're, our, all of our practices and procedures are established to try and set up both I mean, clarity and transparency in the decision making and um, limit all of those types of influences. Um, but you're right, I mean, these are, the energy industry is itself globally is one of the, the largest, um, most influential sectors. I think we, we have the good fortune here of in the economics aligning with what the state policy goals are. I mean, we're, we're seeing a significant push broadly accepted for renewables here, and that's, that's shared by both the policy decision makers, my, myself and colleagues on the commission. Um, so we're, I mean, I think we're moving, we're trying to move in all the right directions mm -hmm. as quickly as we can. Um, and I mean, our, again, we focus on our rules of practice to, to try and limit that influence. Let me ask a, a pointed political question, which you'll probably defer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> Feel free to defer, Jay. <laughs> so the past couple of years in the legislature, there were bills in 2015 and 26, uh, 2016, 2017 that made it to the very end of the, the session to the conference committee that would have established some type of state incentive, a tax credit rebate for energy storage, specifically for energy storage, and uh, it didn't get out of conference committee on both occasions. Do you believe that this is something in principle, with the details yet to be worked out, something in principle that the state should at least uh, consider doing in terms of some type of incentive program that would lower the cost for homeowners and business owners to put energy storage at their homes and facilities? So I know the commission has generally stayed out of testifying on those types of tax rebates and incentives. Um, but I can say, I mean, these are exactly, we're trying to set up the programs that will enable people to sign up um, and install those different types of technologies. And, you know, kind of embedded in the terms and conditions of those programs will be, you know, how lucrative that will be. But whether customers should receive a tax rebate or not, I stay leave, away from that. I leave that to the, the legislature. It's a wise answer. Mm. <clears throat> you know, we were talking about this the other day, and uh, I, I want to mention it to you. Talking about renewables as a group. Okay, there was, there was at one point, and, and I think it was probably the PUC uh, policy, um, that we, we would take all comers, that we, we wanted a, a diverse array of renewables, anything and everything. I mean, right down to wave energy to uh, OTEC, I can hardly remember that term anymore, right? And all these things, and oh, uh, there was, uh, there was uh, um, algae, okay? We, and we had you know, 10 things on the table, and we included them all in the umbrella of mm, this is going to be potentially renewable, a renewable source. We don't think like that. I mean, as a, as a community, I don't think we think like that anymore. It's narrowed. Um, and I, I wonder about your reaction. For example, geothermal is not in the public conversation nearly as much as it was five years ago. Um, uh, algae is kind of gone. Uh, OTEC is kind of gone. 
uh, we're talking, and wind is much less in the public conversation. So arguably wind is in the conversation to some extent still, but declined. Um, solar, of course, is always in the conversation, and now biofuels is in the conversation. It's, it's only a handful of things compared to all those diverse possibilities a few years ago. Is this the right direction? Uh, is there still a policy to say uh, that we want to take all comers, we want it all, um, all these possible sources? So I think a couple of reactions to that. One, I mean, I think we, Commission has articulated a few times the, the value of diversity. I think when you cut to the chase, though, what we've seen in the past few years are at the same time, you know, we're reviewing the price and the terms of all these different, these are, if these are utility scale projects, there's generally some long term contract, whether if it's an IPP or long term commitment, if it's a utility owned project. But anyway, it's a long term commitment. Uh, you're looking at the cost of that. You're looking at the I mean, the commercial terms for the developer, they need to finance these projects. So given all these factors, the, the set of, of technologies narrows pretty quickly um, for, the, for a variety of reasons, but just the, the, the commercial terms of those transactions. Um, that said, we're seeing that's, that scope expand in the sense that people are looking at adding storage to a lot of these projects now where that was not necessarily Part of the discussion earlier. I think when we see this next round of RFPs go forward, we'll see I, possibly some different, I don't know, I mean, we'll, we'll see what emerges. I think, I think it's pretty clear there'll be a lot of interest in solar, solar and storage, depending on the island. I think there's, there's certainly an abundance, there's still high quality wind resources on a number of the islands. So I, there, we'll see if, if those kinds of projects emerge. Um, but you're reactive rather than proactive on this issue. In other words, somebody has to come to you with, with a, a suggestion, a request, a purchase power agreement, something. That's uh, one step of it. The other step is that we do set a lot of the terms at the beginning of the bidding process. So we have a, fair, I mean, a, a key role to play there. And then um, depending on the structure of it, there's an oversight role. Uh, so there is there is more involvement up front rather than just waiting until the power purchase, you know, shows up. The power purchase agreement shows up on our doorstep. Mm -hmm. Marco, we only have a minute or two left, and I wonder if you could, you know, ask some profound final question. It might be just just a, just a thought um, to ask Jay whether he thinks we are going to be able to meet these goals we've set for ourselves. Jay, do you think we're going to be able to meet these goals that we've set for ourselves? Look, I'm, I'm far more optimistic than I was even a few years ago. Um, we're going to keep pushing hard and then see where we end up. But I think particularly in the next five years, um, I think we're probably going to be surprised at how much further we can be than we thought. Okay, we're going to check in with you. Okay. We're going to find out. We're going to take it one step at a time, <laughs> find out how we're doing. Marco, we're, we're really pretty much out of time. Can you make a closing statement on this? I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto, J&J, &J, and that's okay, because <laughs> we'll we will find our way to Emerald City and make our way out with the balloon or not. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs>